All right, folks. Hey, 701. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Hump Day Hangar presentations. We are glad you are here. Uh, we have three great programs coming up in December, tonight being the first of them. And um, uh, the next two are really great. We've got a Whip Air next week, who is going to be doing a factory tour and a history. And then we have Bill Rusk talking about how to flip a couple float planes and still make it to Alaska. So that's going to be pretty good as well. Um, I can't really say uh, enough about how much I appreciate the time and effort our presenter put into bringing these programs to you uh, and for our supporting uh, supercup.org members without whom none of this would be possible. Really, I really greatly, greatly appreciate it. I also appreciate the recommendations for future presenters. Uh, I've solicited from many of you and a lot of you have responded. I have reached out to almost all of them when I've been able to contact them. Uh, some of them are just too busy or not interested, but a few of them have, uh, have signed up. Uh, so please keep those suggestions coming and don't be shy if you've got a program to present. Uh, shoot me an email at steve at supercub.org and um, we can talk about your program and what you might like to do. Um, yeah, so there's that. So tonight we have Sarah Rovner and uh, Sarah is currently an FAA safety team lead representative, a NAFI master instructor, a gold seal flight instructor, a 757-767 pilot for a major US airline. She holds an ATP, CFI, CFII, MEI and has flown over 6,300 hours. She holds a pilot's license in four different countries, USA, Canada, Belize and Iceland and has flown over 147 different types of airplanes in 20 different countries, including oceanic crossings and small aircraft. She's the owner and chief pilot of Full Throttle Aviation, which started out in 2013 as a small flight school and grew into an international business with over 20 pilots moving airplanes around the world today. She continues to stay involved in general aviation through her leadership roles and volunteering for different aviation organizations. Although much of her flying is now professional in nature, she enjoys flying and instructing in her Super Cub patches and her Cessna 170 Stanley on her days off. As a regular flying attendee of Oshkosh, she enjoys the company and camaraderie that general aviation brings. Welcome, Sarah Rob. And let me get- Thanks for having me. Let's do that. There we go. You're on. So today I'm- Cool. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting one of the presentations I've done before for the FAA safety team, although I know uh, a lot of people kind of see bunch, most of my presentations are informative in nature and they talk about different safety topics as well as like winter operations. But this one's kind of uh, more of a lighthearted storytelling event and maybe gives some of the audience ideas on what it's like to get into oceanic ferry flying and small airplanes and just tips and tricks, you know, for flying your own airplane. In my background, you can see the Super Cub patches, which took all of the money I had and all of the time I had to restore. <laughs> um, and it finally flew for the first time on September 1st. So I've been trying to put hours on that. Um, my presentation tonight is called Theta Redost. Now the P is not really a P, it's, a, it's an Icelandic symbol and it actually is pronounced TH, but it's Theta Redost or Theta Redost. And um, I'm going to talk kind of about the history behind that and how it applies to this presentation. So first we'll go with the definitions. It's an Icelandic phrase. They would even say that it's the Icelandic motto for a lot of people, pretty much saying that everything will work out. So when you're like, man, the weather's awful. I can't get anywhere. I can't even fly today. My plane's broken down. You just say theta redost, and it means pretty much everything is going to work out. Of course, Iceland has some of the harshest weather in all of the world, and so it kind of makes sense that the people living there would have a phrase that kind of summarizes, hey, you know, things are kind of looking down right now, but it always is going to work out. And that's pretty much the motto behind any type of ferry flying you do if you've ever done a ferry flight. And I mean, some of them are pretty uneventful, but for the most part, you kind of end up with these stories and these adventures and just knowing that everything's going to work out is kind of just the way to, to live that. I also like to start all of my presentations with a quote. And this is one of my favorite quotes and it kind of summarizes, you know, why I fly and why a lot of people who are watching this probably do what they do. I began to feel that I lived on a higher plane than the skeptics of the ground. One that was richer because of its very association with the element of danger they dreaded because it was freer of the earth to which they were bound. In flying, I tasted a wine of the gods of which they could know nothing. 
Who valued life more highly, the aviators who spent it on the art they loved, or these misers who doled it out like pennies through their ant-like days? I decided that if I could fly for 10 years before I was killed in a crash, it would be a worthwhile trade for an ordinary lifetime. That was said by Charles Lindbergh. A little bit about me. I am a uh, Part 121 pilot for a major airline. It was kind of funny because when Steve introduced me, he said that, oh, I like flying my Super Cub and my System 170 on my days off. And since pretty much that's all I do now because all I have is days off. I haven't flown a jet since March, but hopefully that'll change pretty soon. But I still do fly for the airlines. Um, I'm the chief pilot at Full Throttle Aviation, flown 147 different types of aircraft in 20 different countries. Like I tell everybody, master of all, or jack of all trades, master of none. Uh, hold a pilot's license in the USA, Canada, Belize, fast team lead rep in Philadelphia. And of course, I own a Super Cub, a Cessna 170. And I don't really tell people much about the 172 just because I don't, I don't want people to see it or know that I fly a, a nose wheel airplane, but I do as well. And that one's actually getting an avionics upgrade right now. So an overview of the presentation, I'm going to talk about a few of the crazy stories that I've had. And some of them, I'm not quite going to tell the stories yet. I'm waiting for the statute of limitations to end. And um, so we'll talk about the 210 crossing I did in the winter, uh, flying an air tractor VFR over the ocean, um, tanked ferry and an islander coming back to the USA, um, a ferry that I had recently when I was taking a Jabiru to Haiti. Um, talk about a little bit about international operations, aircraft limitations, advanced weather, and then I'm going to have a slide at the end that goes over all the references. And so I know that some of you guys are going to be like, okay, I want to take a picture of these because I want these weather tools and everything. I will leave it on that slide at the end. And if anybody wants a copy of that, feel free to email Steve or myself and we'd be more than glad to give you a copy of those. So the biggest question I get, well, one of the, well, actually, believe it or not, the biggest question I get is how do you use the bathroom, you know, when you're wearing the suit. But the second biggest question I get is how do you prepare for one of these flights, right? Like, what do you take with you? And I would probably say that the best way to know whether or not you have everything you need is to go out and do it and figure out what you left at home, right? It's like, you know, if you're going to go out and camp in the woods for a week, how do you know that you have everything you need? Well, you go out there for a week and you figure out what you don't have, and then that's what you bring back. So that's kind of one way of doing it. I kind of figured out what I needed over time. Obviously, you have your basics. I mean, even if you're flying, you know, a Super Cub up in Alaska or Canada or even over the Rocky Mountains, I mean, there's a lot of different ways of going about a survival kit. Um, for this particular flight, you know, it's going to be winter. It was actually my first winter crossing. It was going to be quite challenging. And you can see just some of the boxes of equipment that I had, everything from, you know, tools um, to um rafts to survival suits to winter gear things that can kind of help you know tarps to put over the wings and i've I was, i've always kind of gone down the path of being over prepared because you know it's kind of like the old saying is if you need it then you don't have it you know so um i try to take everything with me and hopefully i don't have to use a lot of those things and that's just some of the survival gear that i had for the trip so once again, what gear do you need? Um, a lot of this is preparation. You know, sometimes things that we take for granted here in the lower 48, there's a lot of airports in the world. I mean, believe it or not, Avgas is hard to find in the rest of the world. It's great here in the U.S. and really in North America. But you start getting into some of these really remote areas, and they replaced pistons a long time ago, and they don't have gas out of the truck. You know, I mean, we get so spoiled here in the U.S. I kind of joke, you know, we get like FBOs and a place to sit and all that. Yeah, that doesn't exist in a lot of places. Um, in this particular situation, you know, flying a plane with limited range over the Atlantic, you know, sometimes you have to take a fuel pump with you because if you go to Kujouac or even some of these other smaller Inuit communities up in northern Quebec and none of it, you end up having to pump your own fuel. And so I actually carry around a fuel pump with me um, whenever I'm going on some of these ferry flights, especially because what happens if you divert? I mean, there's no gas out there. You're going to have to get somebody to fly in a barrel and then you're going to have to assemble the pump and pump into the wing yourself. And so that's just one thing that you need. Um, also kind of knowing the kind of weather you're going to be getting into. Um, you have to be kind of careful because it gets really cold and ice can get on the wings. And I try not to scrape up the customer's airplane before it gets overseas. And I don't know if any of you guys have ever tried to get uh, a bunch of ice off of an airplane and do it without scratching it. It can actually be quite hard. So I usually carry a brush of some sort or, you know, use something that's not going to scrape the uh, leading edge or the wings of the airplane. You know, also stuff like, you know, tie downs, tarps, 
Um, and you think small things that you wouldn't even think about, you know, I, one of the other things I do is I, I and a lot of ferry pilots do this is, you know, if you can try to avoid a preheat, then that's great. Sometimes I'll take oil back to the hotel with me and, and warm that up. And so I have a little back, a little backpack that I put, you know, some case, you know, quarts of oil in, um, and I heat that up at the hotel prior to going back out to the airplane. So just little things like that that you don't even think about. So this is a video of um, when I was taking a Cessna Turbo 206 across, which believe it or not, it was, it was a brand new Turbo 206. And I'll kind of go into that story. And um, even though it was a brand new airplane, the thing only has 703 nautical miles of range. And that is the Cessna advertised range, which is really not that much for crossing the Atlantic, even with making a lot of stops. So we had to stop in Sujuac due to range issues. It seems like no matter which way I cross the North Atlantic or what time of the year, I always have a headwind. And so I uh, had to bring a, a fuel pump there, and here I am pumping fuel in the airplane. So we're on our way to Germany in this beautiful 206. And we're up at Kuzwak. Probably didn't say that right. We had to bring our own pump. So here we are pumping. And this time I'm observing. I'm, I'm taking my break because I started on the pumping, and now Dwayne's finishing it here. This is kind of the setup we got. Note to self. Don't buy the cheapest pump on Amazon because they leak. It leaks, leaks quite a bit. So maybe a one-time use kind of thing. But we'll be on our way to a Calvin shortly. Pretty good weather considering it's this time of year. So see you on the other side. So you can see us uh, pumping. I was going along with Dwayne Duick, who's one of... Um, who, who does a, a bunch of uh, uh, ferry flying down in, in Central America in that operation. And and we're on our way to Germany. <laughs> he actually spoke German, which was one of the good reasons that we, we went along. But uh, yeah, so he's pumping the fuel and I'm watching, but I had actually started out pumping. We kind of took turns. So that was kind of a fun adventure. So another question I get, probably the number three asked question is, how do you know these planes are safe? You know, I always make the joke because when you're ferry flying, there's always something wrong with the airplane. And it's your job to figure out what it is before you get over water. Um, you know, talk about test flying. You know, a lot of people think of test flying as being this grandiose, I'm about to fly to the moon. They see all these movies about test pilots. So what are the test pilots doing? They're doing these insane feats and like testing out rockets and strapping themselves to giant you know, exploding masses and, and doing all this crazy stuff. But in all reality, I mean, a test flight is really something you should be doing anytime you get into a new type of aircraft or, you know, any type of aircraft that you're just unfamiliar with. Because, you know, you know the joke. I'm sure some of you guys who have had airplanes before went to a mechanic and tried to squawk something and said, oh, it makes this noise. But, you know, it only does it in flight. <laughs> so, you know, where are you going to find most of the problems? You're going to find them in flight. You know, I mean, I remember reading a, a Mike Bush presentation about how compression checks are cold. They're on the ground. The cylinders aren't moving. And they're not really the best representation of what the engine's actually doing in flight. It's a good place to start whenever you're troubleshooting a problem to kind of look at all the squawks. But you're really going to find the bulk of your problems in flight when things are actually performing the way the plane was intended to. So the joke is you got to find the squawks before you go. Um, I use a checklist to kind of do a, a function test. Um, you know, based on whatever type of airplane I'm flying, I usually kind of put something together and I go up and test it. You know, and this in with the 206 that I picked up from the Cessna factory, I actually went up with one of their test pilots. We marked everything off as part of the acceptance checklist. But, and, you know, and, and if you look at some of the advisory circulars with maintenance, they actually talk about the post maintenance test flight, about how you're supposed to test fly it after maintenance. And these are some things to look at and everything like that. Well, I kind of do that before a lot of these ferries. Um, Finding out a plane is airworthy. I mean, we all know the joke. There's a difference between what's airworthy on paper and, you know, what's what's airworthy in real life. I used to do a presentation called um, Just Because It's Legal Doesn't Mean It's Smart. And I had a friend who came up to me and said, Sarah, if you do a presentation that says just because it's smart doesn't mean it's legal, I will fly all the way up to the Northeast and come attend that presentation. But, you know, the two don't always go hand in hand. So just because a plane looks good on paper doesn't mean it's not going to be a complete lemon in the air. And I'm sure some of you guys have seen that before. I mean, I deal with it all the time because I ferry planes to new owners and they do pre-buys, but a pre-buy only goes so far and the plane breaks down on the trip and so on and so on. So a good test flight is going to find a lot of those issues before you end up in the middle of nowhere, having to overnight parts from whatever manufacturer and perform field repairs with whatever maintenance facility is available. So it's always really good to get that test flight in, especially if you're in a, a new type of aircraft or an unfamiliar aircraft you, especially flight school planes, because those can be interesting. 
Now, if I were to do a presentation in person, I'd have everybody raise their hand and say, how many people actually get the performance that's in the POH? I mean, we always make the joke that if you fly an RV, that you're going to tell everybody that your plane does 300 knots on two gallons per hour running Lena Peak. You know, that's kind of the joke, right? I mean, do you always get the book performance in your airplane? That's a good question, you know, especially some of these older airplanes. I know my Super Cub, for example, has got... I mean, I don't even, I'd have to count how many STCs it has, but it's got a lot of STCs. And the, and the FAA actually came out with this thing about, oh, you know, like your plane becomes Frankenstein when you start layering all these STCs. I was flying a, a, a pressurized Turbo 206, you know, a 210 with a guy just last week. And the plane had so many mods. It had an STC engine. It had, you know, stole cuffs. And it's really funny because, you know, I was like, well, let's reference the POH, but the POH has a supplement and then you have other supplements for each STC and they all have different numbers. So which supplement do you use? Do you use the POH supplement for the, uh, the, the stall system on it? Or do you use the, the supplement for the engine upgrade on there? Or which supplement do you use? And it, it kind of becomes this thing where all planes don't fly the same. You can have two identical 172s next to each other and they're going to be different. So trusting the POH blindly, if the POH says I have 703 nautical miles, well, you know what? I might want to actually check that out myself. You know, I never do the first leg over water. I like to kind of establish a trend and I keep a very detailed performance log. I mean, I sit there with my little red notebook and I ended up having to go with the blue one because I couldn't find a red one <laughs> eventually. But, you know, I write down all the performance that I get because it's going to be different from airplane to airplane. And sometimes the plane doesn't perform, as the person said, and then other times the airplane actually outperforms it. So knowing what that exact airplane is doing at that exact point in time in the airplane's life is really important because a lot of ferry flying is not, you don't have to be an exceptionally skilled pilot, but you do need to fly with a level of precision, especially when you're operating in an environment where you don't have a whole lot of options and backup plans. And this right here is my, one of my performance logs that I performed on the, um, on a ferry flight. And right here, you can see, once again, I kind of wrote down, you know, um, this was, I believe it might've been for, yeah, this right here was for the air tractor that I, I took across. Yeah, because I started having a generator issue. That's another kind of crazy story. And I'll tell you about that one. Um, and yeah, so I'm just kind of like, just most of it is just because I'm bored. But, you know, I mean, clear skies. I write down when I see ships and what their coordinates are and stuff like that. But I'm sitting there writing down stuff the entire time. I'm kind of like, you know, when do I take off? You know, when do I, you know... Uh, what, when did I level off? How much fuel do I have left? And in this particular situation, I, this was on ferry fuel that was in the hopper, and therefore you could kind of see levels to where the fuel was at. But since it was kind of a, a temporary modification, uh, everything wasn't really like labeled. You know, you kind of had you, you kind of had some labels in there to see like how much chemical and stuff you had left, but it was kind of imprecise. So I wrote down everything pretty detailed. Um, and sometimes I scribble it on different pages. So you talk about what other tools do you need for the crossing, right? You have the tools that are with you, like your physical tools, like your raft and your suit and everything like that. But what else do you have? You know, believe it or not, I mean, just with a smartphone, I mean, we have so much data available in the palm of our hand. I mean, the kind of technology that we have now and the kind of weather planning tools, I mean, these, this stuff didn't exist. 20 years ago. You know, I always make the joke, you know, 20 years ago, you had to be pretty brave to do a lot of this stuff. I mean, I, I have stories from a, uh, one of, of my fellow ferry pilots, Denny Craig, and he's telling me about, you know, shooting NDBs off the coast of Hawaii and Japan. And, you know, I mean, that's what they used to do back in the day. They didn't have all these tools. And now, I mean, you have so much stuff. You, I have a marine traffic app that shows me live positions of ships. I mean, four flight will tell you icing forecasts. I mean, you have this global forecast system. I mean, you have so much tools and preparation tools available to you that you just didn't have back in the day. You used to have to, like, leave a voicemail for somebody and find out if they had gas. And now you have all the NOTAMs are electronic. And, I mean, it's just the information that we have available to us is just amazing. And there's so many different tools that I use. And I'll kind of go over those in later presentations. But those are just some of the pl planning tools that I use. I always like to know where the ships are. I usually take pictures of them and write them down when I actually see them, you know, so on and so on. And I kind of use that also to help plan my route. As much as I am a, an optimist, because a pessimist would not fly a single engineer plane over the North Atlantic Ocean, you do have to uh, have some level of pessimism and say, okay, well, I'm going to fly a little bit defensively here, and I want to be as close to land as I can be and as close to a ship as I can be. So that's one thing to think about. 
Foreign procedures. Once again, I'd love to ask the audience, who's flown in a foreign country? Depending on the country, it can be almost like a different planet. <laughs> you know, I remember coming into uh, southern France in, in the King Air, and they were talking French on the radio, and I had no clue what was going on, but somebody had a bird strike or something, and they shut down the runway, and we had no clue because we just can't understand what they're saying. You know, other countries have different procedures and specialized procedures. Like for example, Greenland has a ceiling requirement. If you fly for, you know, pretty much most airlines and everything in the United States, we don't have a ceiling requirement. In other words, like the clouds have to be at a certain level to even conduct an approach. It's all based on visibility, but different countries have different rules. And by saying, well, I didn't know that that was a rule here. That's not a rule in my home country is not really an excuse. And they're still going to try to, to get you in trouble if you don't know the procedures. Remember, things are pretty much standardized under IKO, but people, places do have their nuances. And it's up to you as the pilot in command to know those and follow those rules without getting yourself in trouble. And, of course, you know, just knowing the oceanic procedures and the regulations. Now, there's a lot of, and this is kind of a controversial thing within the entire aviation community. It's like, hey, this is what it says on paper. This is what we do, right? And, and you're like, well, how do I get started with that? How do I get that tribal knowledge? Well, the answer is, you know, the regulations are out there, but it's always really good to talk to somebody who's done it before. That way you can kind of get uh, the scoop on exactly how things operate in that environment. So here I am with this airplane. 5006 Bravo, dubbed Buttercup. And that was the name that the sellers had for this air tractor. I ferried it down to Belize, and then it actually had to come back to the air tractor maintenance facility in Texas to get, I believe it was, um, there was some type of wing eddy current inspection that had to be done. And it was actually cheaper to fly the plane from Belize to Houston than it was to put the wings on the trailer and send it back. Plus, you know, the damage and the, the time and everything like that. And it was in the middle of their busy spray season. So, you know, they didn't want to lose the plane for that long. So they said, hey, will you take it? And they put, you know, fuel in the hopper, which air tractors come, the ability to collect, you know, hopper fuel. You have to do a little bit of plumbing, but it's a fairly easy modification for flight medical supplement. Flew up to air tractor, or I flew up to the U.S. and did it, and then I flew it back. But, you know, flying a VFR-only airplane over the ocean has its unique challenges. One of those challenges is, of course, no autopilot. And uh, with this air tractor, between the hopper fuel and the wing fuel, I had between about 10 and 11 hours of fuel on board the airplane. And I guarantee you, if you've ever tried flying a plane for like 10 hours, it's like treading water for 10 hours. <laughs> it gets tiring after a little bit, especially an air tractor, because air tractors have a horrible reputation for being inherently unstable. I always make the joke that like landing some of the air tractors, it's like literally trying to balance yourself on a beach ball. It's um, They're great for spraying, but man, they're not great for cross country, that's for sure. And uh, this is the little autopilot that I put together. It's a bungee cord. And I put the bungee cord on the uh, windows. Of course, I had to leave my feet on the rudders, but uh, that was my little autopilot. It was also quite cold, so I was bundled up. Because even, you know, in the summertime, you get up to like 10,000 feet for six or seven hours. It gets, it gets cold up there. So there I am, you know, flying the plane across the ocean. You can see a little bit of uh, the hopper fuel in the sight gauge there. And here's one of the videos I put together of my uh, my air tractor autopilot. You can't quite hear what I'm saying because I didn't have a fancy GoPro or anything like that, but that's kind of my bungee autopilot. And as you can see, I'm actually wearing my life vest. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people, like I said, I'm not a pessimist because I wouldn't be doing this if I was a pessimist, but I like to be prepared and try to reduce my workload if emergency were to come. So if I'm ever flying over water, I'm wearing a life vest, you know, especially in a small plane. That way it's just one less thing you have to worry about. You can focus on the emergency. So I do that. And I also wear my, um, my suit. Um, halfway as well when I cross the ocean. And I, I put together a funny video. I, I didn't get it for this presentation, but um, if you ever tried to put on a survival suit sitting down in like a, a chair up against the table, yeah, it's it's actually quite difficult and, and very, I'm sure that if you practiced and did all that, you could get better at it, but it's just something I don't want to deal with. So I just, I wear the suit whenever I'm crossing and the water temperature is, is that cold. 
Um, another thing, too, that you don't think about is just because it's VFR weather, because we call VFR visual flight rules, right? And we define that as, you know, ceilings that are above, well, depending on where you are, above 1,000 feet, you know, visibility that's greater than three miles, so on and so on. But the whole idea behind VFR is that you have what? A visual reference of some sort, right? So what happens when you're, it's absolutely clear, but you have no visual reference? That actually happens quite a bit. You know, it happens at night flying, right? You could be a VFR and have no visual reference. It happens a lot over the ocean too. It can get very, very hazy and you don't always know where the ocean meets the air. And so one thing that I do is I actually carry a, a portable backup attitude indicator. That's a Dynon D1. I have since upgraded and kind of calibrated my stratus and I have a suction cup mount and an iPad that that goes to. But that's something that you might want to think about. You know, if you're flying a VFR only airplane in a, in a place where you're not going to have much of a, a visual, uh, added, you know, a, be able to kind of tell your attitude, then that's one thing you might want to take with you, whether or not you're in a super cub or an air tractor or, you know, anything like that it might be another tool for the job. I was always told that any job is easy with the right tools. And I kind of live by that saying when it comes down to ferry flying, you can never have enough tools. This right here, golden rule, and a lot of people don't do it. It was really interesting because I was at Women in Aviation and I was talking with some of the uh, Coast Guard personnel because they had like a booth set up and I was asking them because I'm really interested in a lot of the survival stuff, really interested. And I went and did a water survival course prior to flying over water, a ditching course, and everything like that. And people say, and I, and I, when I went up to them, I said, what are the chances if I were to go down halfway across the North Atlantic Ocean, what are my chances of survival? And she laughed and she said, you would not believe how many people have died one mile off the coast of the country just because they weren't prepared. And she said, you know, if you're prepared, your survival chances go up significantly. Now you say, oh, you're not going to get rescued out there. But I guarantee you, like, if you don't have anything, then you're, you're definitely done for, right? So you got to take that into consideration. But she said, you know, most people who end up dead in these survival situations just weren't prepared for it. So people go out on their sailboats or their canoes or whatever, and they don't even have a life raft or a life vest with them. She's like, you'd be surprised how many times just something little happened. They weren't expecting it and they just weren't prepared. So anytime that I'm outside gliding distance from land, it doesn't matter where I am. If I'm crossing the Potomac or well, not well, the Potomac's probably short enough, but you know, any of the bays, you know, around the East coast or any of the lakes, or, you know, I went across Lake Michigan on my way to Oshkosh in my super cub. And guess what? I was wearing my, I was wearing my life vest because a lot of people just end up unprepared. So rule of thumb, if you're going to be outside gliding distance of land, take the survival equipment. It doesn't even, you know, the prices of it has gone down. It's easy. It's, they're, they're small. You can, I use a Switlik ISPLR. It's really small. It fits in the airplane very well for a raft. And I have, you know, um, a Reverie, I believe it's a, yeah, I think I have to see which uh, life vest I use, but I can get you that information if you need it. But yeah, just something as basic as having a life vest, having a life raft, could probably save your life. You know, you don't have to be flying over the North Atlantic Ocean. If you're flying over Lake Michigan or you're flying over even small bodies of water right off the coast, I mean, how embarrassing would it be that you were doing a beach tour and you were a little bit too far away and ended up in the water and you didn't even have a life vest? So anytime that you're with them gliding outside of gliding distance of land, have the gear. You know, it can take a while to get rescued. You know, there was somebody who was missing off the coast of Hawaii. He was between two islands. They didn't find him for two days. What would have happened if you didn't have a, uh, a life vest or a life raft? Just simple things like that. You can actually really increase your odds of survival in any type of aviation situation. I remember I was ferrying a, a plane up through Canada on my way to Alaska, and there was a poster. And it had this guy that was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and shorts with flip-flops trekking through the snow with like a first aid kit, you know, strapped around his back. And there was a plane that had obviously had an accident and said, you know, or is this the kind of gear you want to be wearing? You know, I see that all the time. I mean, I see people on the way to Europe and we're flying over like Greenland and stuff and, you know, or, or Northern Canada and they're in like flip flops and, you know, shorts and a Hawaiian shirt. I'm like, man, if we had to make an emergency landing and an evacuation right there, I mean, it's negative 40 on the ground. I'm not quite sure that would have been the, the clothes for it. Another person said, you know, Hey, don't wear clothes. You wouldn't mind spending the night in if you're flying over something and just like I said, so many people are just unprepared, completely unprepared for the situations they end up in. And that right there has been the leading cause of fatalities and survival situations is just being unprepared. She's like, the fact that you're prepared, they've gone through the training and all of that, like increases your odds of survival over a hundred times. 
it's really, like I said, people who just aren't prepared in these small situations. People think, oh, if I get a ditch, a plane full of people, believe it or not, they do a lot better than the guy in the sailboat who didn't have a life vest with them. So, you know, <laughs> that's kind of the situation that people in the, end up in. So this was a Britain Norman Islander. If anybody is familiar with the airplane, it's very noisy. In fact, I would call it one of the most efficient ways of turning money into noise. It's a very noisy, loud airplane. It's slow. It's got two engines. It's very, very slow. And it's really good for short field landings and for small distances, but it's got virtually no range. And um, yeah, <laughs> I think I averaged um, 100 knots or 95 knots all the way across the ocean from pretty much just south of London all the way to the Upper Peninsula. Uh, actually, yeah, yeah, the UP of Michigan. So that was quite the journey. And because it had such limited range, we actually had to go to the factory and they put a, a giant fuel system inside of it. And so, you know, I know people have seen different types of ferry fuel systems. This is the Britain Norman, the approved factory ferry fuel system. And this consists of four um, barrels and then a, um, a ferry fuel pump system. And then of course you have to do the, the special flight permit and everything like that. So yeah, so this is the, the ferry fuel system. It's kind of basic and you can have anything from like, you know, turtle packs, which are kind of collapsible tanks to metal structures. There's so many different ways to do ferry fuel systems. Now that being said, because there's been so many ditchings um, with this kind of just I don't want to call them rednecks because I, I am from the South, so I don't want to insult my kinfolk. But, you know, ferry fuel systems, there are so many different varieties of them, but the FAA has really cracked down on them. And there's a lot of countries that have cracked down on them, too, because there's nothing more embarrassing than having the fuel and not being able to use it for one reason or another. So there's so many different ways of doing it. But generally speaking, unless the factory has like an approved flight manual supplement, which you still need to do a ferry permit for, um, you can go to these different facilities. There's one that's not too far away in New Jersey, and they actually do all the engineering involved. They will actually engineer a ferry fuel system for you. So it's actually quite extensive on the paperwork. It's not as cheap as it used to be, but it is an option if you are going to be flying long distances. I know that, for example, for Super Cubs, I know you can get a belly pod that's like half fuel and that comes with a supplement and everything. That's a really easy way of doing it. But if you're thinking, oh, man, I'm just going to put, you know, a, a turtle pack in the backseat of my airplane and, and have like a little pump that plugs into the cigarette lighter and plumb it up to your fuel system, uh, that's not 100 percent legal. And you probably definitely want to get some type of approval for that just because they're cracking down on it in other countries. And, you know, obviously you're putting yourself at risk, but there's a lot of different ways to do that. So if you have questions about ferry fuel systems, the best way to do it, reach out to me or I'll forward you to the right people who might be able to kind of give you a better idea of how to do it. But this is how we did it with the Britain Norman. And you can see, you know, fueling it up, uh, this particular airplane, the only way to, get, you know, check the oil and all of that was to get on top of the airplane. So there I am, I climbed on top of it. <laughs> there's actually a pretty easy way of doing that. Uh, ironically, I had tried to order a ladder for the trip because we didn't even have a ladder and it arrived two days after we left. So Amazon in the UK, we have it so good here in the US. We just completely have it so good in the US. I mean, you can track your packages and you know when you're gonna arrive. Yeah, it's not like that in other countries, even developed countries. I mean, there's no like live tracking, where is my package now? It's like, hey, this got mailed to you. Maybe you'll get here Tuesday, maybe you'll get here Friday. We don't know. And that's kind of how mail is in a lot of other countries. And so since we didn't have a ladder, I had to climb on top of the airplane to do all that. It was cold, but not too cold. It was October. But if you've ever flown an Islander, they're not exactly known for their warmth and comfort. So we we're bundled up quite uh, heftily in the airplane. Um, you know, I'm with Randall, who I was training on Oceanic Crossings. He's another one of our ferry pilots. And uh, yeah, you can see it was uh, quite cold in the airplane. They actually had to plug up a lot of the heat vents for the back seats because of the ferry fuel system. So it was, it was quite cold in that airplane. But man, were the views great. I mean, I, this was one of the best crossings I ever did. I mean, it was almost clear skies until we got to Canada. I mean, the weather is rarely that good, especially in October. I mean, the weather's been kind of weird as it is recently, but I mean, it was spectacular. This was on the east coast of Greenland as we were making landfall um, just over Kujwak, or not Kujwak, but um, Kulasuk. And it was just spectacular views. And you can see the ice that was just slowly starting to form again. Um, and this was all, once again on the east coast. This was the west coast of Greenland, just absolutely gorgeous. You can see all the fjords there. It's just some of the most spectacular scenery you'll ever see in your life. It's just some of the most amazing photos. And I printed these out and put them up in my hangar in my house. 
Now we're going to talk about tough decisions. Once again, if I was here in a room with people, you know, how many people do you have had to make a tough decision? How many times has somebody pressured you into doing something that you didn't want to do, especially in aviation? Well, man, if I had a dollar for every time somebody tried to pressure me into something I didn't want to do, I think I'd be rich. I think some of you guys would feel the same way. Um, and what even worse is when you start getting pressured by the government or, you know, somebody else to do something. And so I'm going to talk about tough decisions here. So I got hired to ferry this little guy at the Jabiru J250 with the 3300. And I was ferrying it from uh, the USA to Haiti. And, um, yeah, so this was me in the Bahamas after I had uh, diverted there. Beautiful scenery, beautiful scenery. But because of COVID, people kind of – they don't want travelers. They don't want visitors. And um, this was kind of the case. So in the Bahamas right now, and it's, I think that the rules might have changed, but at this particular time, um, you were allowed to fly to the Bahamas as a fuel stop, but you had to be an inbound international flight and an outgoing international flight. If not, you actually have to get approval for inner island travel. Now, I had planned everything out. I've flown the Jabiru 3300 before, the engine, and you know I thought that this plane was going to be burning somewhere along like five or six gallons an hour. After my first stop, it was apparent that it was like an be seven gallons an hour and this one doesn't have a mixture so you can't lean it you can only set the power and so you know i land and i'm like crap i'm not going to be able to make it all the way so i was able to finally push the the guys and i got my inner island uh, permission to fly from so i went from the usa to nassau and then nasa and then i was going to go to exuma and fuel up there and then i was going to continue on the way to haiti but because of some confusion with the paperwork i got stuck at the end of the runway in nassau for a good part of it was almost an hour that I was sitting on the end of the runway and I already didn't have that much gas as it was. So I finally took off and uh, made it to Exuma, got out of there and was continuing on my way. And um, the weather was starting to get a little bit lower. It was very hazy. So I was down to about a thousand feet, but I was over the water. And um, I mean, it's, and, and, well, there wasn't really many clouds, but it was very, very hazy. So to keep a good side of the ground, you know, you kind of had to, to fly a little bit lower. And so, here I am flying across and the weather is starting to get worse. It's starting to get dark. Um, there's really not much visual reference. And I'm just passing Grand Inagua, which is kind of the, an island on the southeast side of the Bahamas. It's the last kind of point before flying, I believe it's 80 miles to the north coast of Haiti. And, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm like, this isn't going to work. So I call up ATC and I'm like, hey, I'm going to have to land in Grand Inagua. And they just gave me an earful. They're like, you know, you can't land there and we're not allowing overnights and blah, blah, blah. And I finally, you know, and it was hard. I mean, they were pressuring me to continue on and you're know, like, we don't want you kind of thing. And I finally said, you know what? I don't care. You can find me on the ground. So I just turned around and landed and I was like, you know, here we go. I'm probably going to get thrown in jail or detained or something like that. Cause it's not the, would have not been the first time that I got detained uh, on a ferry flight. But I finally said, you know what? I don't really care. Whatever the consequences are. We had this saying in the military and I, I still use this true to aviation, rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. So, you know, I'm not going to put myself in a, in a bad or an emergency situation because these guys are trying to pressure me. So I landed and it was actually very uneventful. The, the people were so nice on the island. And of course they wanted their money for the, the call out fees and all that, but they actually opened the hotel for me. Just great people in the Bahamas. And they, they, they didn't even have any clue about like whatever this, you know, the, the, even the customs guy was like, yeah, you're good. You know, like, don't worry about it. You'll be out in the morning. And, and it was a stark contrast difference to what they're trying to do on the radio. And if you've ever had somebody pressure you to try to do something on the radio, there's a one word you can always use. It's once again, this is another tool you can pull out of your tool bag. And that word is unable. If you can't do it, unable. Now, I'm not going to continue flying at night in this airplane and, and, you know, over this terrain with deteriorating weather. It's like, I'm going to try again in the morning. And it ended up not being a big deal. But it was a tough decision because they were really putting the pressure on me uh, to do that. And the next day, it was just gorgeous. You know, I, I flew over from, you know, all the way across Haiti. And uh, at one point, I was <laughs> just off the coast of Haiti, and I looked down, and I had filed for 2,500 feet, you know, until the Haitian coast, and I was going to go up to go over the, the terrain. And, uh, but the, it was once again very hazy, so I stayed kind of low. And I looked down, and I see like a, a U.S. military ship, and I'm like, oh, I should probably not be that close to this ship. 
so I immediately, cause I was at a thousand feet instead of 2,500. And, and so I immediately like started monitoring guard, but they didn't say anything to me. I was like, I wonder if there was like a minimum distance I had to be, but it ended up being uneventful, but uh, yeah, just another thing to think about, you know, if you have to deviate from that flight plan, but obviously in, um, in, in, in this particular situation, I wasn't even able to get a hold of anybody until I was like 10 miles off the coast. So happy customers once I landed they got their airplane and um yeah it was overall a pretty good experience so now I'm gonna have to get into the safety stuff and I'll kind of glaze over this pretty quickly understand the limits of your airplane I mean if you want to be a good ferry pilot put your head in the books you know like I said it's not a matter of being the most skilled pilot in the world I mean over a 2,000 mile distance a lot of times you get to pick you know you can pick airports that have runways that are into the wind you can pick your days, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things you can control to kind of avoid being in a, a situation where you have to use some extraordinary level of piloting skill. Most of what you end up with is these challenging situations that you put yourself in by not knowing an aircraft limitation or, you know, trying to exceed the limitations. So know the, you know, know the limitations of your aircraft. I mean, I don't know how many times people have, you know, had fuel starvation where they ran out of gas in one tank and they had a full tank in the other one. So just, you know, knowing your aircraft limitations is important. You know, have a device that tracks your location. I mean, these things have come down in price. I use a Garmin InReach, but there's Spot. There's, you know, all kinds of different things that people use now um, to have your location. I mean, there's, and they're so cheap. I mean, it's just an easy insurance policy. Just once again, another tool for the trade. And by hauling it around for seven days, you're guaranteeing you probably won't even need to use it. You know, file an IFR, a lot of countries require you actually file an IFR alternate, even if the weather is good. You know, know the procedures of wherever you're going, you know. I use strategic alternates to avoid, you know, if, in case I have an unplanned international diversion. For example, if I'm flying from somewhere in the USA to another point in the USA, but I'm overflying Canada, I often file one of the Canadian airports as an IFR alternate. That way it's like, okay, if I have to, for whatever reason, make an emergency landing, at least I've got the filed alternate in Canada and the flight plan gets transmitted to them and they were made aware of it. In fact, another thing too, is if you don't realize this, the airlines, they actually have to pay a fee. Um, if we use Greenland as an alternate and like our flight planning tools, uh, you know, for flying like across in the 767 and you file it on a weekend, or like on a Sunday or a Greenland holiday, they will actually charge the airline money to file their airport as an alternate because they have to be on standby and don't even get me started with the Greenland fees. Um, another thing too is just check NOTAMs. I mean, I saved, I think 50 cents a gallon on gas once because I was like the only pilot all day at this particular airport that had checked the NOTAM that the big runway was closed. I mean, you don't know how many times people get caught off guard by NOTAMs. This is just simple, but it's something that gets completely overlooked. You know, especially in Europe, because they can be, you know, they, they use NOTAMs like, you know, we use water here. So, you know, I mean, that's something to just take into consideration. Uh, for advanced weather, I'll kind of skim through some of this. Um, I know that there's a lot of weather planning tools, and I, I mean, we just have so many available to us. Um, some things that I used, um, you know, from different tools that I use from different countries. Um, you know, understanding icing and icing forecasts. You know, a lot of people get themselves in trouble with icing. I mean, we just lost the 210, it was a, a few weeks ago. Um, due to freezing rain. I mean, there's just, you know, icing can really just take over an airplane really quick. And that's something they get to take into consideration. And a lot of times, you know, when you're ferrying small airplanes across the water, if you encounter icing, it's, it's like, it's kind of like you're done. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that there's not ways to get out of that. But you know, if, if you're wrong about the forecast, and you launch in bad weather, and it's freezing to the surface, you really don't have a whole lot of options. And of course, there's these old, old tales of people going down to 10 feet above the water and getting the salt to spray on the wings. And I don't really know if that's true or not. But you know, I mean, the, one of the last ditchings we had was in 2008. Um, there was a few recent, more recently than that. But you know, um, you know, this person, you know, flew into icing conditions, you know, and, and it was just kind of, you know, game over at that point. See, it's one thing you really got to be thinking about is, you know, when you're fl ferrying these small airplanes across these large bodies of water, you don't have a lot of options. If weather turns, it's not like you can, oh, divert, press, press the nearest button on your Garmin 430 and find some place to land. That place is 300 miles away. So you have to really be pretty accurate when it comes down to weather. And of course, disclaimer, follow your POH. Anything that I say is just general advice coming from an advisory circular, but anything that your aircraft POH says about any of these topics is going to be the most controlling factor in anything when it comes down to how you handle icing and, and everything like that. 
Um, if you want to learn more about icing conditions, I can't say enough how good Advisory Circular 9174B is. I mean, it gives you so much information. I mean, if, if you just need, if you're just going to be sitting somewhere for 30 minutes, you know, and you need something to do, I can think of a lot of different situations where you're going to need something to do for 30 minutes while you're sitting somewhere. Read this Advisory Circular. It's, it's absolute gold when it comes down to icing. And it talks about all the different types of clouds and temperatures, and you'll actually learn a lot from it. So it's a great Advisory Circular. You know, it talks about different temperature goals, about liquid water content of clouds. You know, you get to a point where it's too cold for icing, and it's also, you know, time when it's too warm for icing. So understanding where the ice is is important. In this situation, I was flying at 21,000 feet over the North Atlantic in a Cessna 206. And, of course, the G1000 is misleading because it never shows the clouds. <laughs> but I think I was an IMC for this, which is actually quite rare to get clouds at 21,000 feet. But it's usually associated with some type of front. And, of course, my temperature was negative 25. That's usually a good temperature that I shoot for um, to avoid icing conditions. This right here is a bunch of good tools. And I'll kind of go over some of these briefly, and I'll be putting these on again at the end. Uh, resources for advanced weather, the grommet, which I'll kind of talk about, North Avomet, Auto Router. Um, and, uh, you know, for flight, WSI Pilot Brief, NAV Canada, the Greenland Met Office, Iceland Met, Met Office, uh, CNM for Mexico. And, of course, call the locals because locals really know what the weather's doing even more than the forecasters do. You know, back in the day when you called flight service, they actually connected you with somebody who lived in that area. It's like, hey, I want to know what the weather's doing in Anchorage. But now you call for, like, Anchorage and they give you somebody in Kansas. So, you know, if you really want to know the, the weather, you know, call somebody local, call the FBO, call a local pilot or a school or something, and they'll kind of tell you what's going on. Um, the grommet is a tool that I use, and it's a lot of ferry pilots use this tool as well. And now, but four flights really gotten good, and a lot of the tools that you would have looked for on the grommet are now available there too. It's a graphical vertical flight path weather forecast based on the global forecast system. It combines all the prognostic charts, airmet, sigmets, winds aloft, a lot of tools in a really nice graphical nature. And I've found that they're pretty accurate, but there are limitations. This is a straight line distance tool. So, you know, you could be literally, your straight line distance could be like look perfect, right? And you could have giant thunderstorms, you know, half a mile off each wing and the grommet wouldn't even pick up on that. So once again, you know, it's one tool out of your toolbox, but you really need everything in order to make the best decision. And this was an example of what a grommet would look like. And this was going from Kinger Lusowak in Greenland over to Keflavik. And you can see the Greenland ice cap there. It tells you the temperatures. It shows you the different types of clouds, um, where some of the icing might be, as well as the temperatures as it goes along the way. And this is an example. And you can use it here in the U.S. I usually go to autorouter.arrow, and I usually look these up there. And you can pull two points in there. You can kind of take a look and see what the weather's doing. And it's a great tool. It even has a little legend on there you can look at. And it's just a good reference. And you can put your altitude in there, your departure time, time and route, your route. And it's actually a really cool tool. So I recommend that if you just, you know, want to play around with something, it's a really good tool. Once again, another grommet. This was going from, uh, you know, Texas to Belize, straight over the Gulf in the air tractor. And I had some of that stuff there, too. Um, of course, you know, a lot of, I feel like the art of reading a lot of prognostic charts is falling away, but um, it's also a really good tool. I use, you know, prognostic charts and surface analysis charts extensively in my ferrying operation. I mean, even domestic, especially international. I like to get a good picture, a broad picture of the weather, because knowing what the weather is doing as a whole is a really good way to start. You know, I was talking to one of my students today, and he was like, oh, you know, I just read the tasks. And I was like, yeah, but the tasks are, are just one point at one particular, you know, state and time. I mean, you could be crossing a, a horrible occluded front or a warm front with freezing rain, but hey, the tasks might be clear on both sides of that. So you got to be really kind of careful with, with just using the task. So I like getting the a whole idea, a huge, the big picture of what the weather is doing. So I use a lot of surface analysis and prognostic charts for that. Model data, this kind of talks about precipitation and the likelihood of icing. This is a tool that's used mostly in Europe, um, you know, through North Avomet. I also look at the infrared, and I also look at the infrared a lot in the United States. And you can kind of see a lot of the composition of the clouds, where they are. I use it, but I do use infrared quite a bit for IFR and for VFR. Of course, winds aloft, this is kind of a tool that everybody can see, and it's really easy to use as well. And I like to compare all the tools. I take a look at, you know, what is a grommet saying versus, you know, what is the prognostic chart, surface analysis chart saying? What about the model data? What about the icing forecast? What about the segments? What about the winds aloft? And I compare all these tools together in order to kind of make my own forecast. 
Um, you know, I'm not going to get too much into microclimates, but if you live in Los Angeles, the weather is unusually good. Whereas Atlanta, which is a very similar latitude, the weather is not nearly as good. And so, you know, understanding microclimates can be important too, if you're doing long distance flying, because, you know, like for example, Iceland has a microclimate. Look how far north Iceland is and their, te and their temperatures aren't nearly as cold, especially on the Southwest side as they are in Calgary or even, you know, parts of Minnesota in the winter. And it's because there's a microclimate involved because of the currents, you know, in the warm water and stuff like that, warm comparatively speaking to the land. So that's one thing to take into consideration if you're flying into somewhere with a microclimate. Seattle has a microclimate. It's foggy there a lot. A lot of low ceilings, a lot of moisture, whereas Yakima on the other side is quite the opposite. And even though it's the same latitude, so those places have microclimates, usually because of geography, weather systems, you know, currents, and stuff like that, you could have a microclimate. And that's one thing to think about. You know, I talked about microclimates. And of course, make your own forecast. You know, I always make the joke that if there's one job that you can be bad at and never lose your job, it's being a weatherman. You know, you can be wrong every single day of your life and you still get to keep your job. How many other jobs are like that? You know, if you're an engineer and you're wrong all the time, you're going to get to keep your job? Probably not. But if you're a weatherman, you can. So make your own forecast. Take a look at all the available data and say, what do you think the weather is going to do today? And make the most conservative and best decision based on all that data. Use those tools, you know, pull them out of your toolbox and make a decision from there. But just going blindly or just trusting what somebody else says is probably not the best way to go. Because like I said, weather forecasters and they've been, to been, they, they've been known to be wrong on more than one occasion. And here's the references slide if anybody wanted to get a picture of that. Um, you can just kind of play around with some of these tools. The Gromit, North Avabit, which is really North Avabit is going to be good if you're flying in Northern Canada and, and Europe and stuff. But Auto Router can be good. You can even play around with the augments. Um, it's just a bunch of really good tools here. And of course, you know, the Advisory Circular, Pilot's Guide to Flight and Icing Conditions, which is also a very good reference. So now I'm going to open up the floor to any questions. I know that uh, Steve is going to read off some of the questions that people have, and I'd be more than glad to answer them to the best of my ability. Well, first, Sarah, that was awesome. It just, I, I just fascinating. Um, so we have uh, um, folks. If you want to use the chat function, if you have any questions for Sarah, I have several. Um, <laughs> which might be something you use the chat on YouTube too, if you want to I'm kind of monitoring that over here. Um, so I'm curious, and you can unshare your screen if you want to, I think when people are, uh, oh, got a question coming in already. Let's see what we got here. Uh, so they, John Wood, and I was going to ask this question too. How do you, uh, what's your typical charge? How do you, how do you, uh, how do you typically charge someone? If, if I wanted to have an airplane ferried somewhere, how would how would that work? That's a good question. And, and of course, you know, it's a question that I get quite a bit. And the answer really is it depends. It really just depends on what the airplane is. And it's kind of hard to say. Um, generally speaking, the lowest we charge is $400 a day, but it goes all the way up to, you know, you know, thousands. Um, depending on what the airplane is. Uh, we normally charge by the day, depending on what the type of airplane is and the type of operation. I mean, if you're talking about a 172 from like Houston to Dallas, that's going to be a very different situation than a 172 going from like, you know, Germany to, you know, a, you know Maryland. So it really just depends on, on what the type of airplane is. Um, annual compensation, there really aren't that many people who do it for a living, like full time. Uh, most people that do ferry flying that I know personally do it more as a part-time thing to supplement whatever their other job is. I've been kind of ferrying full-time, and let's just say that uh, when I go back to flying the jet, it's going to be a, a lot less work for uh, quite a bit more pay. <laughs> so um, I'm not saying that you should be turned off from a career in ferry flying, but um, unless you're ferrying bigger airplanes like 737s and Gulf Streams and Falcons, um, it's, it's really hard to try to make a, a, enough money to, you know, have all the toys as a ferry pilot. Hey, talk, talk a little bit. How, how often do you come into situations where you just, where you say, I'm not flying this airplane from here to there. <laughs> I mean, does that, I assume that that happens. Oh yeah. 
<laughs> that, that happens quite a bit. Usually I weed these people out on the phone. One, one of my really good friends, uh, Byron, who's been doing this, you know, avionics project in the 172, he said, you know, as soon as somebody calls him and I hear the word cheap come out, <laughs> I, I run for my life. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, I get that all the time. People don't want to put the money into the plane and, or, you know, their first time buyers and buying sight unseen. They found it on eBay and, you know, somebody asked me the other day if I could ferry a 210 from them. I said, oh, okay, you know, in the course of conversation, how much did you pay for it? $5,000. I said, I don't know if I want to, you know, it's always, it's got a ferry permit. The gear has to be down. Oh, it's got 142 squawks on it as well. And one of the squawks was, does not conform to type design. Not kidding you, real story. And <laughs> I said, I don't want to fly that. Actually, I don't think that was a 210. I think that was a Cessna 337. But the guy paid less than $10,000 for it. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. But we've gotten to airplanes before. And it's like, you know, this one's, this one's not too nice. And, and that's happened before. Hey, you got another question here. Um, so... A person says uh, transitioning from a 150 to a 172 is a big jump for some pilots. How do you make the jump from something like a Super Cub to an air tractor or a type you've never flown before? How do you deal with it? Like uh, was the Norman Island or was that something you'd flown before or did you have to get checked out in it or how, how do you manage those kinds of things? That's a really good question too. Um, I always tell everybody that my first time in a turboprop was solo, which was true. It was an air tractor, <laughs> a 502. Um, it's a one seat airplane. You can't get a checkout. I remember when I was getting checked out to tow gliders, the local soaring club, and they had Pawnees and, you know, I had been flying a Satabria at the time. And, you know, I had to get, I think I had to get a hundred hours of tailwheel before they would let me fly the Pawnee, but you can't get checked out in it. And there's a lot of situations where you just can't get checked out in it. There's either somebody who's not available, or, you know, I remember one time I went to go pick up a T-51, which was like a mini Mustang with bicycle tires and a Rotax. And, you know, I thought I was going to be able to get to go up with the owner on one flight. And he's like, yeah, I weigh 300 pounds and I'm not going to fit into the back seat, So you're on your own. Or, you know, with the Islander, I thought that I was going to get a checkout from this other guy who they had actually paid. Then I, I meet the guy and he makes me sign a waiver saying, I'm just going to show you how the ferry fuel system works. I can't give you any notes on how to fly the airplane. And he had thousands of hours in Islanders and, and he would not even tell me, I was like, well, what's a good, you know, this and that. It's like, oh, they can't tell you anything for liability. I'm here to show you the ferry fuel system. So I kind of got to fly along with a, a safety pilot of sorts. I, I don't think he would have let us crash, but he really wasn't that helpful. So it really just depends. You know, I mean, you fly as many types of airplanes as you can, but when you're getting into these airplanes that are one seat airplanes or they're like limited by some type of limitation, um, you can't always get a checkout. And so a lot of the key about it is studying the airplane, maintaining proficiency, especially with emergency procedures, knowing the, the numbers, the, you know, your, your emergency procedures. Um, a lot of that comes into play. But a lot of it is, you know, sometimes you just have to get in and do it, you know, and, there, and there's really no other option. Now, if there was another option, I would have gone that route. And I have many times. I mean, I've gotten checked out by other instructors, owners, and other airplanes. But sometimes when that's not an option, you kind of just got to go in and figure it out. So and and so I assume you carry some kind of insurance to to do all this sort of stuff. Does your does that cover the airplane that you're ferrying then as well too, or how, how does that work? I mean, it just I mean, in a nutshell, I'm sure it's complicated, but and it's even more complicated since I'm now a licensed aviation insurance agent. <laughs> oh. So yeah, I am, and I I just got finished with all the paperwork, and I'm going to be uh, working with Clemens out of uh, Kansas to to be doing um, insurance for my customers and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, insurance is kind of a complicated situation and I could get into like, you know, liability versus, you know, whole and all of this, sure. but to make a really long story short, I do have a, a, a non-owned liability policy for ferry flights, but generally speaking, we have the owner obtain an insurance policy because a liability policy only goes so far, right? It only covers your liability if you're at fault. But, you know, an owner's policy covers much more than that. So we always recommend that and now we can, you know, help get the policies for the clients that they obtain their own insurance. Gotcha. So, so um, a question comes in, do you ever, do you ever fare an airplane with the owner wanting to ride along? Uh, quite a bit. That has been one of the most popular things that we do. Um, somebody buys a new airplane, 
and they want to get instruction on the ferry. So most of the time that happens and the ferry pilot is acting as a CSI on the ferry flight and the owner is receiving instruction. I do that all the time with people and do IPCs, BFRs, transition training. Uh, sometimes the owner just wants to fly along and not receive instruction. So, um, but yeah, but that's actually quite common in the ferry world. And I also saw that, you know, do you ever have, you know, people, you know, do you ever take people along with you who are not uh, the owner, and sometimes we do as well. We had an internship program for a while that would obviously have to be, you know, allowed and covered by insurance and allowed by the owner. But, you know, occasionally we do have people who come along on ferry flights with us. So what's the longest leg you've ever flown in a single engine airplane? Oh, single engine, probably the air tractor. I think I did an eight hour leg. <laughs> That's not terrible. We have a, we have members that have flown nine hours and 45 minutes in a super cut and non-stop so, <laughs> if you could imagine. yeah that, that's true <laughs> yeah everybody, i mean it's, everybody it's, knows lou <laughs> yeah <laughs> and i haven't i haven't done any pacific ferries so i don't know what that's like over the pacific but i know some people are flying for like 14 hours so very good well thank you so much sarah this is really interesting uh, just uh, just uh, kind of a little bit different than a lot of the stuff that we've done and and I, just absolutely fascinating I, I can only imagine we flew to the bahamas a couple of years ago and that scenery down there and i've been to haiti before actually too so thinking about the scenery and seeing that from the air down there would have just been uh, pretty pretty neat and uh, i just can't imagine i can only imagine that the views that that you get in this job are are probably one of the most rewarding parts of it so thank you so much. Uh, I don't see any other questions popping in and I uh, appreciate your time. And hopefully okay, we thanks will, for having me. Well, I know you've got some other uh, presentations up your sleeve, so maybe we'll have you back here one of these times if, if you're available. Well, thank you so much. All right, thanks, Sarah. All right, everybody, <laughs> good night. We will see you next week for um, Whip Air and the history